This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, and you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Okay, I've taken down the guards. What do we do next? Now you have to break the grid. That's me. Uh, I've got the character with the hacking skill. Cool, cool. What do you do? I uh, reroute the uh, stacks, and then I'll PRX the fiber nodules. <laughs> is that supposed to be hacker lingo, Jerry? I mean, it is now. And with that, welcome to the Foreign Skeleton episode of the Mr. Commander Podcast. Tonight, we discuss playing characters that's smarter than you are in your tabletop role-playing games. Along the way, we'll take your comments, examples, and suggestions live from the chat room for life on Twitch before jumping into the after show. But first, my name is Jerry. My name is Phil. And I am Old Man Logan. Good evening. Welcome back to the show. Mm -hmm. Let us run through our temperature check and see how everybody is feeling. Phil, how you doing? Uh, I am physically feeling fine. Um, No aches, no pains, no complaints. On the physical front, um, also um, cold and COVID free, so check check. And um, mentally, I'm uh, doing okay. I've had one or care. two weird, like little bouts of like um, I don't want to say unplaced anxiety, but like sometimes I get anxious for no real reason, which I guess is part of how anxiety works. But like, it took me a little bit to trace it back to a thing like, oh, it's a money thing, right? But then when I thought about it, I was like, but it's not really a thing. Like, yeah. it, there's not a logical reason for me to, like, I've had one or two like little bouts of those. Not, um, they're not the worst, but I'm not a fan, right? I'm not a fan when I get kind of spun up and anxious like that. Um, but for the most part, um, kind of have that under control and uh, doing okay. And uh, yeah, I'm working from home this week. So uh, I'm also enjoying the calm of working from home. So uh, that's me doing okay. Jer, how about you? Good. Um, it's kind of getting back into the regular schedule thing. So uh, things are calming down a little bit for me. Um, feeling good mentally, feeling good physically. Um, just kind of enjoying things. Looking forward to uh, a fun weekend this weekend, too. So lots of stuff to look forward to, which is always good. Awesome. Bob? Yeah, so mentally really solid. Feeling feeling good mentally. Um, physically, I've uh, been running a little bit uh, uh, wild on, the, uh, on the, the muscle from the from the neck down along the shoulder blade into the middle of the back. Just been acting up like a, you know what. So. I could have said, does it, what, does it lead to explicit. anything else? Like, does it lead to like headaches or is it just like oh, literally like shoulder blade back kind of thing? The, the vast majority of the, of my quote unquote sinus pain for the last like 15 years has actually been, um, like neck and, and, and muscle injury, muscle, uh, injury, muscle Ouch. Uh, aches and pains and stuff. Turns out there, they, they weren't really sinus headaches that I was getting. I learned that from my chiropractor. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so it's been acting up. So I've been doing, you know, some, some things that, uh, I should be doing more often, <laughs> little exercises and stuff to stretch things out, learned a couple new ones. Um, but you know, it's, it's more annoying than anything else right now. So, um, I'm going to chuck that up to, you know, I'm not debilitated and, and laying in bed going, uh, so, yeah. so good on that. So, and good enough to do a show. So let's do that. A show. Do we have any announcements tonight? I don't think so. I think, I think we're, we're uh, I think we're all good for this um, for this particular week. Nothing to report in. Um, nothing to call out on uh, the Kickstarter front. I'm not aware of anything recent. Um, I did. I, I don't know if it's not a huge announcement, but Free League sent out an email with like their like year, like their plan of stuff for the year. Oh, really? It's pretty pretty. Oh, it's pretty impressive. Like Free there's a lot of killing it. They're doing a good job. Anyway, that's not really an announcement. Um, no. If we want to, we can chat more about it in the after show, yeah. but um, we'll leave it. Right. We'll leave it right there and move along. 
All right, well then that brings me to bumper time. Here you go, Phil. Workshop, workshop. We're talking about playing characters that are smarter than you. How are you going to pull it off? You're not smarter than your character. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? How is everybody going to believe you? How are you going to be smarter than you actually are? We're going to talk about it tonight here in the workshop. And don't suck. Suck. I always wonder if my neighbor, luckily my neighbor's not home, because I think my neighbor would be like, what the hell is he doing down there? What like, is going on? What's going on with this guy? He's doing his like macho man imitation. Like, right. just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, All right, Jerry. Uh, in bo- All right, so um, we're playing two games right now. Uh, Knights Black Agents, which for the rest of this show we're going to refer to as NBA, which is like with basketball, and Ox, which is our Cortex game. And both of them, we're playing characters that are experts in things that we, as players, don't have as much knowledge in. Um, this can be tricky to play and tricky to run as a GM. So we thought tonight we'd talk about that, the challenges that come up with playing or GMing characters that are smarter and more skilled than you are, and ways you can make it work both mechanically and also during a, a narrative. Awesome. And of course, in order to do that, Phil has to give us some terms. So let's do the thing. Behold, you are in the presence of Definition Panda. Yep, yep. Um, got two definitions for tonight. One builds onto the other. Um, the first one is competent, right? Having the necessary ability, knowledge, or skill to do something successfully. That's... Um, and we see that in RPGs, right? Competency is represented by some combination of your um, role slash uh, class, skill, attribute, abilities, powers, things like that, right? So if like in Pathfinder, how competent you are as a fighter is a combination of um, your class's hit bonus and your strength, right? But in but your ability to survive in the wild, that's survival, and that's going to be a skill with levels and also an attribute bonus, right? So they kind of they kind of come from two different places. Um, now, depending on the game you're playing and its power curve, your competency in things may run from being fairly incompetent um, all the way up to our second term for the evening, which is hyper competent, right? very highly competent makes sense um in rpgs this represents somebody who is an expert in something um or some number of things uh and depending on the game that you're playing that may mean that they are highly trained or could mean that they're the world's leading expert uh in an area so in nba Um, Having a one in an investigative skill. So this is a gumshoe game, right? For people, I think people know that, right? Knights Black Agents is a gumshoe game. Um, And so having a one ranking in an investigative skill makes you highly trained and an expert. While having a two or three means you're one of the top people working on that subject, right? So, you know, Robert Langdon would have like a three, right? For um, cryptology or something like that, right? Um, Symbology, symbolism, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, so clearly playing a world expert in chemical engineering is going to be tricky to play out at the table. Jerry, let's talk about some of those challenges. All right. Well, the crux of the challenge is going to be that in most cases, we as players are not hyper confident in the areas that our characters are. But we're going to need to portray them as such to maintain the immersion and progress in the game itself. So depending on what you're supposed to be hyper confident in, this can be really hard to portray. Yeah, so like it's one thing to like your character to be hyper competent in driving, right? Um, and role playing that in the game, right? It's not hard to role play being a great driver. Um, it is another thing to role play being hyper competent in molecular biology or theoretical physics or something like that. Yep. However, in addition, the mechanics of many games don't always make competent or hyper competent people feel like they're actually competent at their skills. Yeah, you like you could have like a big fat bonus in driving, right? You're hyper competent in driving, you have a big fat bonus. But if you like spend the whole night rolling, like we're I'm gonna say ones, right? It's for a D20, but like just rolling yeah. failures, you're gonna look like you can't pass a road test, right? Mm-hmm. You're not gonna feel very hyper competent. Nope. Nope. So 
the crux of the issue is going to be the same. It's going to manifest differently depending on what side of the screen you're on. Yeah. So if you're the GM, so on the GM side of the screen, um, you need to portray a variety of hyper-competent characters, right? They could be the peers and mentors of the players, like as NPCs. They could be the mastermind villain that's plotting to destroy the galaxy that the PCs are up against. Um, yep. And you're going to need to be able to sound hyper-competent across a number of areas while portraying these NPCs, as well as you're going to have to craft the plot and the story and the plans that these hyper-competent NPCs um, have created, right? You, your, your mastermind can't just put together like a smash and grab on, you know, the galactic bank vault. Like it's going to have to be, you know, a little slicker than that. In addition, you are also responsible for conveying information to the players through their senses, right? Um, you are, right, that interface, you are the senses of the players. And we're going to talk about this in more depth as we get into the segment further, but you need to convey what they see, smell, taste, hear, et cetera, through the lens, through the lens of their expertise. Um, because people who have expertise see things differently. Yep. And that rolls over to being a player, because as a player, your main duty is going to be your character. That includes embodying what that means to be hyper confident. You need to play and speak as if you're an expert, and you have to recall common knowledge for an expert. But you're also expected as an expert to make decisions and take actions based on that knowledge, which is knowledge you don't actually have. So what that means is your character has expertise in something, say, small unit tactics. But as a player, you're telling the GM you want to walk into a valley where you're about to get ambushed. Um, your character would know better, or at least know how to do it better, but you as a player might not know that. So, yeah. Bob? So on one hand, it sounds tricky to portray something like hypercompetence. But at the same time, we play games where we portray things like superpowers and magic all the time. Can't we just treat hypercompetence as a kind of power? Phil, from a mechanical approach, how do we portray the hypercompetence of a character in the game? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you bring up a good point in terms of um, it, it's not an insurmountable problem to portray right. hypercompetence. We portray all sorts of things that we can't do in role playing games, but this one um, is sometimes a little tricky. So, um, from a mechanical aspect, hypercompetence <clears throat> is really a success, it's a function of successful checks and proportional outcomes, right? So what we mean by that is that somebody who is hyper-competent should be able to succeed more at something than a person who is not hyper-competent, right? And that would make sense. And they should actually be able to do more with a successful check or action than someone who is not competent. For example, in a game like Cyberpunk, an expert hacker should be able to crack into the hardest systems and should be able to write code to do things in that system with ease. Um, and should be not even close to comparing to a simple college student in that setting who just has a few ranks of computers and knows how to, you know, illegally download music. <laughs> Did your mom totally buy you a computer? Thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what yeah. We're, but to be clear, what we're saying is that there shouldn't, we're not saying that there should be no chance of failure, right? Hyper-competent right. characters can fail. But they fail in a different place than yeah. non-competent characters, right? Um, a non-competent character is going to fail at the simplest level. A hyper-competent character is going to fail at the hardest things and probably will succeed nearly 100% of the time at simple things, right? Um, and, and that's like a big difference. And it's not something that always shows up mechanically, Um a lot of times games will just try to address this by um, slapping on some bonuses. We'll talk about that in the link just a few seconds. Um, in fact, I'll kick it over to Jerry to talk about where the rules come in for portraying hypercompetence. And when Jerry's done, I'll come back and we'll talk about um, where you as a GM fit into that formula. So hopefully, as far as rules are concerned, your game's going to do most of the work for you. If it was designed for characters that, to be hypercompetent, um, a great example of this is Knights Black Agents. Uh, in Knights Black Agents, having even a one in an investigative skill means you always find the clue related to that skill. If you have a one in the skill you need, like history, and there's a clue, you're going to find it, regardless of what you roll. 
the preparedness. Well, you don't roll. Game, you don't roll for NBA. The truth. Right. With, with investigative, you don't roll. Correct. You roll, roll for investigative. Level. Exactly. I'm thinking about which is which is also one of the ways that it portrays yeah. hyper confidence. Yes. Right. Correct. It just removes the randomizer from the equation. You roll for the non-investigative stuff, like Correct. shooting vampire, like shooting vampires. So, <laughs> um, but there's also this preparedness skill, and that portrays competency and planning. And there's the uh, MOS rule that gives you one free success for free with your main general skill. You're just going to succeed at it, and that's really useful because you get to do things that make you seem really cool. Um, and so the challenge, though, is that not all games go to the length to make you feel like you're hyper competent. Typically, a game system is going to represent hyper competency to a larger skill bonus, but still puts you at the whim of task resolution, which, depending on the game, can leave a lot up to chance yeah. and mean that you still might be hyper competent and not succeed at things based on the rules as written. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of hinted, we've kind of touched on that a couple of times. So now, as a GM, you also can help portray hyper competency um, in the mechanics of the game by changing when you call for roles, right? So you don't have to always call for a role. You can just hand wave an action that a player takes and be like, that succeeds. Um, in addition, if you do call for a role, you can set the difficulty and you can control the narration of success or failure. Again, depending on your system, sometimes the narration of success and failure goes to the player. But in most traditional games, narration of success and failure goes to the GM. So first of all, you can just have, I said before, you can just have certain things succeed, not need a role. So the hyper-competent hacker wants to break into a cell phone, um, no role. You can just be like, oh, it's fine, you break in. Right. And sometimes and if you do this, you'll throw people, you'll throw players off because I have seen players pick up dice ready to make a roll for something. And I'll be like, oh, no, no, you just like you just get into that. It, that's not that's not worthy of your level of skill. It's got cheese ball locks. You just push right through. Yeah, just push right through. Exactly. Second, if you do call for a roll, you can set the difficulty to be easier. Um, based on the context of the situation, right? So breaking into the cell phone for an average person could be like a, you know, in our fictitious system here, a daunting task, right? With a high um, threshold to succeed. But if the hacker takes the phone away from the unskilled character and is like, oh, I'll break into it, you can just change the difficulty to trivial. It's the same check. It's just that in context of the character, as a GM, you could just be like, oh, for you, that is a trivial task for, you know, for this other character, it was daunting. Yeah. yeah. And then lastly, you can narrate the um, outcomes of a check, the successes and failures, um, and also enforce hyper competency. So like an average person, like going back, this was, I think, Jerry's, um, going back to Jerry's example about the ambush, right? Um, the average person would make a tactics check and realize that the valley's an ambush, right? Like, ooh, the valley's dangerous. It's clearly like a place where we could be ambushed. But the hyper-competent person not only knows when they make their successful check, not only knows it's an ambush, but as the GM, you could be like, yes, the valley's clearly a optimal place for an ambush. And the best place for those people to be would be on this ridge with this angle, right? You can actually just narrate more information yep. based on the fact that they have greater expertise and knowledge, um, yep. as opposed to somebody who has less expertise and knowledge, where you be basically give them the basic information, like, yes, the valley is a death trap. Don't go into it. Whereas your expert, it's like, oh, clearly this force based on the way they train, they would always take the Western Ridge because the light won't be in their eyes or something. Yep. Yeah. So coming right off of that, besides the mechanics, we can also make a character feel more hyper-competent through the narrative of the game. Jerry, why don't we talk about that? All right. We don't need to rely just on skill checks and dice rolls. We have to portray the hyper-competency. We can do it all through narration in the game. Both the GM and the player are going to contribute to this. Yeah. So again, as GM, you're the senses of the players, 
right? When you narrate what's going on in the game, you are telling the players what they see, what they perceive. Um, when we are skilled in something in real life, right? When we're skilled in something, we see things differently, right? Um, a master thief does not just see a building. They see its security flaws. They see the ways in and out, the lines of sight, things worth taking, et cetera, right? And as a GM, we have to describe the world to the players in those terms, right? So like if our master thief walks into a restaurant, I might say like to like to to any other character who's not the master thief, like, oh, it's got, you know, a door in the front with a glass window uh, with patrons sitting on the inside. There's a bar, um, you know, there's a bar as you walk straight in um, and then, you know, it opens up to the left to the dining room. But for my master thief, I might say something like, well, you know, you notice the, you know, you notice the Mark three security device on the, you know, you know, craftily placed in the door as not to, you know, detract from the um, to detract from the decor of the restaurant. Um, you see that the bartender doesn't do a very good job of tending the till and leaves the cash register open too long. Uh, and you notice that, you know, not only is there a way out the back through the kitchen, um, but you're, you know, but you're fairly competent, you know, you're fairly, you're confident um, based as you walked up to the restaurant that the bathrooms both have windows um, that lead out into the parking lot, something like that, right along the lines of, of giving them that information through their expertise. Okay. Now, when it comes to GMing hyper-competent NPCs, it's actually a bit easier um, because you know all the secrets in the game. Uh, so hyper-competent villains know all sorts of stuff, right? They know, they know how the world's going to react to things they do. They know stuff about the PCs um, because you know stuff about the PCs. And so they can just know that stuff and then plan for it. Um, and then you do that like in some ways because if they're hyper competent, they know what's going to happen next. And since you, the GM, are reacting for the world, right? You're you're playing both roles. You're doing you're portraying what the NPC does. You're also portraying what the world does in response. You can um, just have that NPC because they're hyper competent compensate for those things, right? So, um, let's say you know we're doing crime here. You're hyper competent mastermind has stolen something and the players you know go to call the police because you know they want backup only to find out that all cell phones in the area are jammed because the hyper competent bad guy knew that the first thing anyone would do would be to try to call 911 and you know blocked out cell reception in the area yep all right now that's all well and good if you're the gm but as a player we can't always expect the GM to translate the world for every person at the table through a combination of our skills. So sometimes as a player, we have to ask the GM to redescribe things through the lenses of your expertise. So uh, if you're trying to just look around the restaurant, come out and say why you'd have it a, a bonus. Like use a phrase like, as a master thief, what do I see about this restaurant that doesn't look normal? Now, in some cases, you're just going to get more info for free. In a worst case, you might need to make a roll or check. But beside your senses, you can also phrase how you take your actions by uh, using your hyper skills to describe your intent instead of the exact action. For example, as a master tactician, I have to assume that they will ambush me in the valley. So I want to move through the woods in a way to get behind them wherever they're set up. Doing this is going to remove you from having to accurately describe exactly what you're doing and explain to the GM what your intention is so they can determine how that's going to actually resolve in the game. And it also gives your GM a little bit of a hint of what you're trying to do and how they can show your hyper competence you know feed your gm never a bad thing mm -hmm. exactly yeah i'll just right, so before we be yeah, actually ahead. before we wander off on that so this is a thing where the player and the gm can actually work together right so where they um where the player says something um you know like the um you know gives the intent um the gm can either know that right and say okay cool like they're, they're definitely up on the western ridge um, or can kick it back to the player and be like, cool, you absolutely know where they are. Tell me where they are and why they're there, right? Like, that's absolutely like a collaborative thing you can do is you can just like, you can defer to the player as the expert and just let them make something up, right? Yep. Like, 
oh, they're clearly on the Western Ridge because, you know, back in, you know, battle of whatever they, you know, they, they took the Western Ridge um, and it was a decisive victory. So, you know, this unit always will take, you know, will take the Western position if they can, you know, and just make that up and be like, oh, cool. That's great. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be just GM or player, right? We can, we can, we can collaborate to make things seem smart. And honestly, that that player GM collaboration makes for a much better game, in my opinion. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. When you're working hand in hand to make that flow, you get, I think, a better story, and and mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> and the result, I think, uh, it comes out a lot better. Um, I'm actually going to dip real quick into the chat room because Andy said that um, she's had D and D players just say. You know, like pick up the dice and be like, I'm going to do the thing and go to roll the dice. And it's like, no, 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 don't pick up the dice until I tell you you're going to need to roll because yeah. you may not have to. Right. Yeah. And that's a situation where if you've got that that back and forth with the GM and the players, then you're not jumping the gun and just like, well, I'm going to attack or I'm going to try and outflank them and I'm going to roll my dice. It's like you you work together. And the synergy of that combination is going to work towards the hyper competence way better than having to to stop and be like, no, no, wait, don't roll. You don't have to. Yeah, that, that feeling that like everything that you have to do in the game is tied to a die roll, yeah. right, is, um, you know, can be can be pervasive, right? I, one of the things I really like in PBTA games, it was one of the things that really highlighted it, highlighted it for me in a PBTA game is that if there isn't a move that's triggered, then it just happens. Yeah. Like, like you don't always have to roll survival to do a survival thing in the game. Like sometimes the GM could be like, Oh, you've got a plus 10 in survival. Cool. This is like, these are berries. Like these are edible berries. Yeah. Like, you know, just you have a high enough bonus, you know, to eat, you know, you can eat these berries. It's fine. Like, it's not necessary. I need you to make a roll to see if you can survive marching through the snowstorm, because that's tricky. But I don't need to make you roll to know if you can just eat, you know, some berries, especially if the berries have no consequence to anything else in the story. Like one of these right. moments where you're just like sitting chatting with an NPC and you're like, are you know, is there any like edible fruit here? Because I just want to give them some like, you know, like something to eat while we're talking to them to like, you know help establish rapport right like you don't have to be like okay well roll you could be like what's your what's your ranking in survival plus 10 oh yeah no problem you find some berries on a tree that you know are like sweet um and just pick them and hand them you know to the to the to the npc also important to point out things about hyper competence to characters as the gm that they might not um they might not realize about their character like if you're out in the wilderness and the you know, the fighter is trying to start a fire. Um, that might be a survival check, but the ranger can start a fire without making a check because they do this all the time. Exactly. You know, don't even make them roll. You know, like the fighters like, oh, what do I need to roll this to start a fire? Well, you're going to have to look at your survival check or, you know, the ranger's really good at this. He can do it without even making a roll. You know, so you get, it's a good way to bring characters who aren't as active in by pointing out their hyper competence. Yep. Exactly. And I love that kind of stuff, right? I yep. love, I love the idea that, um, one like that a given task is not the same check for two different characters. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now there are some cases where you don't hand wave that stuff, like, no. like lighting a fire, like for instance, in forbidden lands, because there are like explicit rules for making camp and, and to touch on what Kevin Lovecraft, who, um, who has joined us in the chat room tonight. Hello, Kevin. Um, Kevin brings up, right? Roll when the consequence or outcome is interesting and can drive the story. So in Forbidden Lands, when you fail to make the check to establish camp, interesting shit happens in the game. Like characters can't rest. And there's like a little table of like other things that go wrong. And I, when we first started playing, thought it was kind of a cool mechanic. And then about a year into playing forbidden lands one night 
um, on the way home from a relatively like they were just on the players were on their way home from having finished an adventure. They botched three camping checks in a row. Yep. <laughs> and it got scary. Like you guys like could have died scary. Like Sweet it was deprivation and <laughs> negatives to checks and like it was no one brutal. had healed. Like yeah. it was it was like when they reached home that like after that journey, we were all like, oh shoo. Like I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. And it was cool. Yeah. And so the game, so I guess my point of this is yes, as a GM, there are times where you wave your hand. Um, and just don't have players make checks, like Jerry said, with the fighter and the and the ranger trying to make a fire. But if your game mechanics have that specifically have um, mechanics for certain things like that with interesting outcomes, to go back to Kevin's thing, then you should stick to those. Like I would never, like we never in Forbidden Lands hand waved traveling home. Nope. Like travel was always the thing in any other game I run. Traveling home is almost always a hand wave. Yep. But that game just had interesting things happen when you traveled. Yeah, they built which an was entire just a subsystem for travel in the wilderness into the game. It's a piece. <laughs> yeah, and it's fantastic. And and gaming and BS is in the chat room tonight. Oh, we, who do what we have, have we done? Yes, geez, what? we've 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 cast Here. some. Summon friends who haven't been here in a while. <laughs> wow. I'm 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 a little moved tonight. Place is hopping. All right. Ah, right, well, because the place is hopping, let's let's move this thing along here. That's yeah, that's yeah. the first part of our look at hypercompetency. Yeah, um, we're gonna take a quick break, check in with the chat room, and then we'll come back to our round table discussion about hypercompetency. But before Jared, we do, Jerry, I think he's talking to you. Oh, before we do, Bob's going to tell, I thought we were past all that because we've gone off script a little bit. Um, before we do, Bob's going to tell us about another show on the Mr. Dr. Mark Network. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, hey, I don't know if room. you know this, but we've got a, a show on the network called Mastering Dungeons. Um, you got to check this. If you're a D&D fan, you, you owe it to yourself to check out Mastering Dungeons. I have to say that. RPG veterans and game designers Teo Sabadaya and Sean Merwin look at the game and the hobby of D&D from a variety of viewpoints. They report the news, they understand the business, they review the products, they illuminate on the design. Whether you're a fan, a player, a DM, a designer, Sean and Teos cover topics of interest to you. They, they've been doing a hell of a job. Um, you gotta check. D&D fan, check out Mastering Dungeons. Okay, so the chat room is just popping right now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, oh man yeah this is nice this really this is um what's called this is a nice uh what's called nice visit nice um group here yeah oh, geez. kevin lovecraft gaming bs and and then i mean andy's here like we got we got peoples yeah, i saw a few I other people crayon is too. back yeah lemming is here yeah this this is Good, good crowd tonight. Good crowd. Tonight. Good crowd. Coming. Excellent. Excellent. Let me do a quick check here and make sure there wasn't anything else that was brought up. Yeah, I'll just mention really quick in case people um, aren't totally familiar. When we talk about our Ox game, right? I know Jerry mentioned it at the top of the show, and we're definitely mm -hmm. going to talk about it when we get to the round table. So um, for people, like if you're if you haven't been listening or you've heard us make it um, in a couple of references here and there, let me just mm -hmm. I'll explain it really quick. Ox is our um, Cortex Prime game that we built, uh, where we uh, the players are super geniuses that are traveling aboard a sentient starship, traveling from planet system to planet system, solving uh, disasters and helping out with problems. And um, it's kind of like it's kind of like the show Scorpion um, crossed with some sci-fi, like like Firefly thing or something. <laughs> um, we just I, I played. Was, we we just played I, our I first was, session of it. I always said it was Scorpion Cross with Thunderbirds. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's probably a good it's, representation of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's good. It's um. Yeah. I mean, I. It, it's funny because it was a um. Uh. Yeah. Kind of Scooby Doo in space ish. Um. Less mystery though. More disaster. Yeah. Um. But it was um. It was a passing thing. Um. 
it was a passing reference I made about like, I just want, I just want to go around doing really good things. Like I want a game where people go around doing really good things and just like help people or whatever. And yeah. you guys were like, yeah, we should play that game. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> like, yep. let's do it. Yeah. So, so uh, Kevin it'll Lovecraft, come, it'll made come up. Excellent. Yeah. Kevin Lovecraft made an excellent uh, uh, statement in the chat room. Um, and he said, I would simply say my character just had a brilliant insight and tossed the ball to the GM. That's another way you can do it. Like I'm a super hyper competent thing. Maybe you're not like a hundred percent sure exactly where you wanted to go, but <clears throat> you're like, Hey, I just had a brilliant insight. And you give that GM that look and maybe the GM riffs on it and then turns around and sends it back to you, you know, create that back yep. and forth. Got it. Get that cycle. I, I mean, I do, I do have to say like for, um, running nba is a um is a workout um in terms of prep um in, in terms of prep nba is very much a workout i have to put together a lot of stuff uh in advance like i can wing some of it but i kind of have to put some stuff together in advance for you guys to find or know or whatever um i do a lot of like really um i do a lot of googling <laughs> like my NBA search history is um, is definitely going to put me on a no fly list in the future. Hundred percent, that's hundred percent. That's going to happen at some point. I'm going to get asked okay. some additional questions based on my search history. Um, but it's tough because that's a table full of hyper competent characters all oh, asking yeah. questions. Yep. Right. Um, and while I know I know some shit, <laughs> I definitely don't know everything. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing that, that, um, that wraps into the whole hyper competency thing, the style of game that you're the, or maybe I should say the genre that you're playing like NBA, it's more of a grounded in reality kind of a thing, even though we've got vampires. Yeah. Right. It's, it's super spy, you know, Jason Bourne meets vampires. So there's a, there's a portion of it that's kind of grounded in reality. If you're playing something that's more fantasy where like everything's on the table, you can fake a lot more of that shit. Yes. Right? Or the ox yes. game that we're playing. Like I just started spouting stuff like, you know, oh, in order to get this thing, you the enough energy to 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 make this thing happen, we gotta break the hot coefficient in order to 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 get this thing to loop back on itself. And like and I just started spouting some bullshit, right? It doesn't yes. have to be real. No, it was, <laughs> but it was it good. sounds nope. hyper competent. <laughs> Yep. And that's part of what makes it fun is just coming up with lingo and so on. Yeah. Yeah. We'll uh, NBA is later. actually on my end more challenging because yeah. I do have to be like, okay. Like, I mean, when I do it, like when I do an NBA scene, I have the skill list open. Yeah. And like, I look at a room, like a room or a scene and I'm like, okay, which of these skills are definitely going to be present in this room? Yes. Right. And I have to like kind of chuck through the list and say, like in Ox, when you make up stuff like that, I'm just like, yep, cool. That's it. Let's roll some dice. Right. Yep. Like my notes for um, Ox are incredibly lean. Like there is a fire cane approaching the, the coast. Yep. <laughs> the players will have to deal with it. That's there you go. Like, <laughs> yep. I gave the fire cane some stats and then I'm like, and the players will figure out what to do about like how to lessen it or protect the town or like and the we city came or up whatever. With some like, wild shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I know, right? That's I think that's my inspiration is the um is Peter Quill, right? Like Yeah. <laughs> you wing it till it works. When all else fails, come up with a better plan. So Yep. So <laughs> all right. Well stuff. all right. Good. Let's uh, let's jump into the second half here with our uh, roundtable discussion about hypercompetency. And uh, Phil's mm -hmm. going to lead us off with question number one. Yep. What techniques do you use when you are GMing hypercompetent characters in a game? All right. The first thing is just have them succeed at competent things that other characters would have to roll for. I mentioned this before. Um, the rogue is going to notice the CD characters in the bar. The slicer is going to is going to notice immediately when somebody's got a virus on their computer. It's something simple. Um, 
the space pilot is going to realize the best way to uh, cut some time off their trip and that sort of thing. Make sure others see this and make sure the NPCs sometimes comment about their skills. Make the players feel hyper competent, not just, you know, the rogue walks up and picks the lock. Two or three people go, wow, I've never seen anybody pick a lock that quickly or nobody's ever picked that lock before or something like that. Reinforce to the players yeah. that they've got, uh, they've got this. But also when you're GMing the hyper competent characters, make sure that you um, have them do things and don't unnecessarily jack up the difficulty unless it actually fits the scene. Um, mm-hmm. This is what I call the, 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 the Pathfinder effect. Pathfinder is a great game, but if you've played the APs, you know that as things go on, when your characters are 12th level, you don't ever encounter a group of 12 third level bandits. Every bandit is 12th level. You know, your character has your, your character is fireball, but all of your enemies have six levels of rogue plus evasion and are wearing rings of fire resistance. Don't do that. Have it with some of the more important encounters, but with generic encounters, keep the difficulties at a point where it becomes awesome when the characters do things, even if they have to make a roll for it. Um, the you know the 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 thing that the, the hacking skill that comes up um, is a difficulty six, and, and the and the player is going to be rolling a plus twelve. They're going to make it, but let them roll. Let them see that amazing success, and then narrate how cool that success is. That's one of my suggestions. I'm going to tack on to that because I think I've hit on a couple of good things. And I'm going to cite two different Musketeer movies to mm-hmm. make my uh, to make my point here. Always good. Um, the first thing I was going to the first thing that you made me think of was um, reputation. Right. Mm-hmm. Characters that are hyper competent start to carry a reputation. Yep, right. Absolutely. So so it's <laughs> so if you want to make a player feel like you want, if you want to make a player um, feel like their character's hyper competent. It's one thing, like you said, to have an NPC comment like, oh, I've never seen anyone pick a lock like that. But it's another one that, like, weeks later, like sessions later in the game, they're in town and, like, somebody comes up to the table they're drinking at and is like, I heard you picked, you know, the, you know, the, the Duke's vault um, lock, you know, like, like out of the blue, right? Like, just comes up and is like, I want to buy you a drink if you'll tell me how you did it. Like, you know, like just play into their exploits, like, you know, come at them and say things like, you know, like those kinds of things be recognized. Like for instance, that um, I was thinking of the Disney. um, Yep. I uh, I knew you're going with this. You know, Porthos the pirate, right? Like as soon as like he, like he says it a couple of times and no one pays attention to it. But then finally the scene on the boat, like when they see who it is, it's Porthos and then they the pirate, right? And some of them just jump yep. overboard rather than fight him. That's like, a good callback, fan- right? It's yeah. a fantastic callback. Your players will absolutely appreciate that callback. The other yeah. one is also another Porthos reference from um, was it the Musketeer, or I forget which one's the one with the airships? Uh, the three Musketeers. It's, it's, I think it's the, the Musketeers. The, the Musketeers, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Um, when they have the big fight in the courtyard and the Cardinal's guards come up to Porthos and he just like reaches down and like just undoes his sword a little and they all take off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It's, it's that kind of swagger. Like let your care, let your players have some of that swagger. And then my second point to tack onto Jerry's was um, absolutely throw a third level set of bandits at them um like you know from time to time send something that's beneath them they'll know pretty quickly in fact you can even narrate it like the bandit stands in front of you like the point of his dagger isn't really in line like he doesn't look like he's very well trained at this in fact and the tip is quivering a little bit right <laughs> exactly and just let the players play off of it like Oh, could I, can I disarm him really quickly? Like, can I, you know, can I, in fact, I want to disarm him. And then I want to tell him to go get in, like, get into another line of work. Be like, yeah, absolutely. Like that just happens. He's not even worth, like, he's not even worth rolling against kind of thing. Like it's absolutely. Ju- go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, good. I'm going to jump back in with, with a uh, fellow podcaster and part of the MMP network, Ange Murray. I um, mean, the very first masks game I ever played 
that they GM'd. Um, there's a scene where our heroes are trying to rescue somebody and we end up going to the enemy base. It's basically like a Hydra base with extra villains in it. And we show up and the doors open up and out come literally like six dozen powered armor troopers and a bunch of guys with guns and 12 flying hover tanks. And I'm thinking, oh, great. And the GM turns to the first player and goes, okay, describe how you guys mop these up. And I'm like, what about dice? They're like, no, no, no. There are eight of you and your superheroes. These are just guys with gadgets. Tell me how you how you mop them up. And all of a sudden, everything got cranked up to awesome because now we got a chance yep. to describe how our characters did our things, how we succeeded. Um, I've got to say the one cool thing about that was the players played off of it enough that it was, you know, well, I walk in and I use my power staff to take out these three guys and I do X, I do Y. And then a hover tank flies up behind me and I don't see it. And then that player turned to the next person and said, and then what do you do? And, this was, and then I come in and save you from the tank by doing X. The players yep. not only showed competence, but showed how they played teamwork, which is a different topic. Yep. But just that whole thing of just tell me how you accomplished this yep. just made us all of a sudden feel like superheroes. So I will cite one of my favorite games, um, Swords Without Master. Mm. Um, this is the difference between the perilous phase and the rogues phase. Yep. Right. In the rogues phase, it is exactly that. It's show me how you mop up these guys, yep. that kind of thing. In the perilous yep. phase, we are fighting because some your lives are on the line. And sometimes flipping a scene, like you said, Jerry, to the the equivalent of the rogues phase, just to let people show off in a narrative way, super cool. Yes. Super cool. And it's an it. easy, easy way to give them the hyper competent moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, 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 essentially what it does is it takes the dice out of the equation because that's where we sometimes don't feel very hyper competent, right? So just allowing a bunch of superheroes to narrate how they tear through these minions um, is great. And it looks like a comic book. It feels like a comic book. Absolutely. It's amazing when that happens. It is also a great way if you are running short on time as a GM and you need to like move quickly through a scene. Like you can just flip it to one of these hyper competent yep. moments, get through this minion scene and just move us along to something that's a little more. This new. was supposed to be a regular yeah. encounter. Now it's a mook fight. Tell me how yes. you clean up. <laughs> Boom. Tell me how you clean these guys up. There we go. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, my, my tips on this one. Um, <clears throat> In addition to the stuff that I had tacked onto Jerry's. Um, so I am a big fan of m deciding when to make calls for skill checks. Um, it is, I think, easily one of the um, best ways to portray hyper competence is just to simply tell a character, you don't need to roll for that. At your skill level, you don't need to roll for that. You're good. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and I think that's like, and I think that's empowering because one, it helps move things along. Um, like we talked about before, essentially it turns like the skill check into the MOOC fight, right? Because you're just like, oh, yep. here's the information. Um, and um, it also, I think, shows like, I don't want to say like respect. I think it reflects upon the character. Like at your level of competency, I'm not asking you to make roles for this kind of stuff. Like it's just not necessary. Like you're, be you're beyond these kinds of checks. We're looking for the big stuff now, right? Like, I only need you to make this check when some, like, when you push your limits. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other thing, like, so this was a huge thing when we, um, on my end, when I was starting to work up the idea of like, how will we play super geniuses in the Ox game, right? How are we going to play, like, like, not even, not smart people not smarter than you people but like the smartest person on the world kind of like people like how are we going to play that and, and so the little thing that we came that like i i wrote up and then ran it past you guys and we tried it in the game and it totally worked was that um for anything that you want to do that's like super smart like a solution kind of thing to a problem like i wrote five things down like you have to you have to know what the problem is. You have to know what the solution is. You have to um, create the solution. You have to implement it. Ah, shit, there's one more because I'm one finger short. 
And there was a fifth one. I forget what it was off the top of my head while we were recording. Yeah. Um, but the rule that we had was I, I don't want to roll for all of these things. It'll take way too long to do them. So anytime you're going to do something super smart in the game, uh, you pick one of those five things that you want to roll for. And I will pick as GM, I will pick the other one that I think would be interesting for the story. And the other three just happen. We don't, we just don't worry about the other three. Those three things just fall in line. Um, like for instance, Bob wanted to build a bomb to try to, um, it was dissipate a cloud of super uh, flammable gas, wasn't it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So the one you picked, you were like, I want to engineer it, which favors your skill in engineering. Cause you're like a master, like a genius builder. And I was like, cool. Uh, my choice is the implementation of it. Like you got to go fly the bomb into the cloud. Like, I think that could be interesting if you screw this roll up. And so one of the ones that wasn't on the list was acquiring the, oh, that's the fifth one was acquiring the material. There you go. Yeah. So, I need to get there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I got there. Um, and so the, one of the roles was like, you don't need to, uh, we don't need to roll for you to acquire the material. I, and we just narrated like, oh, the government of this planet just brings you the bomb material that you need. Yeah. Like it wasn't going to be interesting. Oh, we can get that. And, Boom, done. Yeah, we can get that. For you. And on the flip side, I did like something very similar with Jerry when he wanted to um, use these artillery drones to create a shockwave. And um, yep. Jerry thought he was going to have to convince people to let him do it. And I was like, no, like, I don't, that, that part's not interesting. Um, you got to, you got to coordinate with them. Like, you got to communicate the solution to them and you got to implement it. And it, it turned out in play. And again, we've only played one session of it. But I like I liked it. I thought it like I thought it was kind of a neat way to tackle the super problem rather than being like, oh, cool. You want to do all those things? We need to make like 10 rolls right now. Yeah. Like, I need you to make a roll to, f to figure out what's going on. I need you to make a roll like for this. I need you to make a roll for that. Instead, two rolls. And I forgot the other part of our little house rule for this. If you spend a plot point, you may pick both of the things to roll yep. instead yeah. of me. Um, yeah. but I thought it did like a pretty neat job of feeling, um, feeling to the genre, right? Like, yeah. um, I mean, I'm kind of picturing this as like an hour long TV show. Um, yeah. that's again, Scorpion for all of its ridiculousness yeah. has, become, <clears throat> has become my guide and inspiration for this. It's a series. fun show. It is a, a fun, fun show. show. I'm going to go back and watch some of it. It's on, it's on Paramount Plus. I'm going to go watch some of it because, for God's sakes, it's exactly what we're playing, just the sci-fi version of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But like That's you said, that, that was a nice – what it is is a nice balance. You've got these five things that you know have to happen, right? And like you said, if you try and roll for all five of them, you're bogging down the game and it's going to take forever. But on the yeah. flip side, you don't want to be like, let's make one roll to encapsulate whether or not you succeed on this one task, on this whole task. Yeah. It gives you the balance between the two. It gives the player the opportunity to say, this is my strength. I want to leverage that, right? So they pick the thing that they're really good at. Then the GM can say, well, I think it would be more interesting also for this other thing that maybe you're not as good at. So we'll add a little, a little excitement in there because you're not sure if you'll be able to pull that one off because you're not as good. And then, like you said, you get a plot point, you spend a plot point, and, and the player can be like, I'm going to pick both of them. And you can be like, let's do this thing. But that also yeah. gives the player the opportunity. There's a thing you can do in the game where you take the die for the thing you're really good at, and you can step it down and be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this against myself. Kind of like uh, self-compel oh, from fate. That's hinder. And, it's, and yeah. you flip it to a D4. Yeah, you flip it down to a D4. And get yourself a plot point that you can use yes. for other stuff later. So there's all kinds of things that play into it. But yeah, it worked out really well at the table. Yeah, we're gonna do a future episode about our like after we've gotten like four or five sessions in, we'll do it, we'll do our feels on Cortex. Um yep. so far my feels are good. Like yeah. <laughs> so far, like yeah. a lot. Um but yeah, we'll do it. We'll we'll do a more in depth. I think somebody asked on, I think it was on Twitter, if we would um, compare and contrast uh, fate and cortex. 
Um, and while we have plenty of fate knowledge, I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to get a little more cortex under our belts yeah. before we, before we feel like we can speak knowledgeably on the subject. I'd also like to We'd try definitely cortex be able to game. do it though. There's, there's a lot of shared DNA there too. So yep. that's, yes. I'd like to try a, a cortex game that has a, uh, I, I, I prefer ox right now, but I'd like to try a cortex game. That's a bit more, um, crunchy to see, to compare it also how that compares to fate. You know, action sure, scenes, sure. you know, mm-hmm. other, other rules, because we're playing a game that's very um, abstract yes. in the way we yes. deal with things. And I don't, mm-hmm. and, and it's a good thing. I just think that comparing, I think we need to play a couple different variants on Cortex to, to try it. So, no, no, I yeah. think you're 100% right, right? Like, like yeah. first of all, we don't even have a combat skill in the game. Right? No, we like, don't. <laughs> we, made, we, made a, we made a conscious decision, like, like fighting does not solve any problem. Nope in this game which i love right i I was very cool with like cool we're only gonna brain things but you're right like we did what we did was we abstracted the um we abstract the mechanics of being super geniuses um senda and i and i'll talk about this probably more in the after show this week but um we just converted the long live the queen game over to cortex uh and came up with the uh building blocks for characters and um that's a game that could get a little more into one-on-one, uh, like into combat and things like that. Combat if something goes wrong, but um, but it'll be more turn-based, more sneaking around espionage stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. My my first experience with Cortex, with Cortex was uh, in a BPRD game, and that's where I saw how the dice mechanics worked really well towards handling powers not having to define them we'll talk about that though in, in the after show yeah and don't so. worry because one day i'm gonna just run underground using cortex like ah, i did go. it once with fate i'm absolutely gonna run <laughs> underground <laughs> using cortex so that yeah, that will also happen. resurrect that game yeah <laughs> yeah That's all right happening. to wrap up question number one i did not actually answer it because uh, uh again you know those who listen to the show i haven't gm'd in forever and a lot of the stuff that we talk about um weren't even things that were on my radar when I was running games, but this one I did at times, especially when I was running my 4E game with the, the, the honestly hyper competence of the team that I was running. Um, they uh, would occasionally get me to be like, uh, you know what, I'm just going to throw the, the mook the mook room at them and let them mow through a whole pile of people and just Ooh. have that moment of badassery because, you know, they would do it with, skilled opponents as well but every once in a while i would just be like the hell with it and just like here's a room full of cobalts boom go you know (laughs) um but yeah i never i never even thought about it in those terms like you know giving them that hyper competent moment to 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 boost them like it was a different era (laughs) let's just leave it at that all right what's question two jerry do what techniques do you use when you're playing a hypocompetent character in a game bob yeah so we talked about this briefly we mentioned it uh, earlier uh lingo baby um this is something that i've only recently started doing but i i I enjoy it and it really helps to uh to give you the illusion that the character you're playing knows what the hell they're talking about just start talking like you know what you're talking about just use phrases terminology especially if it's not grounded in reality if you're playing a fantasy game, uh, uh, anything like that, um, our aux game, I just started spewing out things that sounded super sciencey, and I was like, "Here we go, let's do it." But the other thing that I did was I wrote them down so that I can reuse them to reinforce certain concepts instead of just blathering Good on idea. and like having two situations that are relatively similar and use a completely different phrase that doesn't make any sense, like in context, like. To give it that illusion of like, yeah, this is super sciencey and stuff. <laughs> so here we go. Um, that was uh, that was the thing that I really hit on for for playing the hypercompetent character. Um, the other thing that I would do is again, um, if you're if you're short on uh, ideas and stuff, lean into the GM, source the table. Never be afraid of sourcing the other players at the table. You know, if you have to, and you're like, "Hey, Jerry, what do you, what do you think uh, for this for this moment? What do you think my character would uh, would would do or say?" You know, grab some help. Maybe you're having one of those nights where you know you're just like, "Ah, oh, 
like normally I'd be able to, to quip a couple of things real, real real fast off the top of my head. And tonight my brain is just slow. Like I had a long day at work or whatever. Crowdsource, baby. Never hurts. What about you, Phil? So I think when uh I think when I um when I play a hyper competent character, and honestly, I play more NPCs, right? Because I'm I I mean I just mm-hmm. I GM way more than I play. But if I am playing a hyper competent character, right, I kind of think like um I think I, I think I think my best examples are to kind of follow what Doc Ock does in Superior Spider-Man, right? Like he like he realizes that like Spider-Man's gig is like incredibly um incredibly tedious and so he just keeps automating parts of it like parts of being a superhero like he's like this the this swinging around the city thing looking for crime is like completely inefficient i'm gonna build a bunch of spider bots yeah make some bots send them out yeah so i like so along that same line, which by the way, I'll just say once again, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm it, it's uh, preaching to the choir to you two, but boy, if you have Marvel Unlimited and you have not read Superior Spider-Man, like just treat yourself to like 25 issues of just sheer yeah. writing genius. When I dropped I off comics, Marvel I was on issue 14, I think. So I missed like half of it almost. It's I've so- never read it because Marvel Unlimited doesn't work on, on desktop computers. It only works on tablets yeah it is sucks. such a brilliant such a brilliant storyline anyway um so as a player i will um like the thing i will try to lean on is using my intellect to make things work easier for my character in the game right like can i create a program that does this can i build a device that does that can i you know do those kinds of things can i can I use my computer skill to write a program that'll search, you know, the, the, the dark web for me, that kind of thing. Like I always, I try to find like ways that like the purpose of being super smart, right. Is to, to be able to build and do cool things. So I want to just like build things that get rid of the, like the mundane tasks, (laughs) right. In other words, what I'm looking for is like, Hey, GM, I will give you the narrative um i'll give you the narrative positioning to wipe out some of these roles like i'll write a search algorithm that searches the dark web therefore we don't have to make roles for doing simple searches on the dark web you can just give me stuff and if you want me to make a role to make the program cool i'm down for that um it's one of the reasons in um hydro hackers the hacker can write programs and then the quirk to it is that when you write a program um it basically mechanizes a move in the game right to do it for you autom- autonomously and um depending on how well you roll you get to put some bonuses into it but it always comes with a quirk a bug um and i've got like you know in hydro hackers i have a list of kind of like some really interesting bugs and players love taking advantage of some of the um some of the things like it throws off its shackles at some point during the story like it doesn't want to work for you or it starts to spread uncontrollably to other systems, those kinds of things. But anyway, point being, I try to use my hypercompetency to um, feel hypercompetent, right? Like just knock off mundane things. If I'm a hypercompetent wizard, I'm going to write a bunch of spells to do things like clean my room and keep my clothes clean and, you know, make sure my food stays warm when I'm interrupted. You know, my tea, I, you know, come in, come in to talk to me and I'm working on a spell to make, you know, a um, tea mug that will always keep my beverage at the correct temperature, no matter what's happening or how long I neglect it. Like, why? Because I can, because, you know, I'm, I'm really good. I'm Dr. Strange. I'm going to make a, you know, I'm making a, I'm making a mug of eternal warm tea because I can. Anyway, Jared, what about you? Yeah, but that, that takes away one of Wong's best lines. Uh, for me, uh, I'd say if you're going to play a character, play with confidence. When your character acts, acts like you're hyper skilled. Don't try to do something, just do it. If possible, explain how your skills make things possible without describing always uh, exactly what the thing is you're doing. Um, you know, walk into the room and just assume your character is going to be the smartest person in the room and act like it. 
You know, if you're going to go up to that lock and pick it, don't, you know, be cautious, but like, okay, listen, I know how these things work. I'm an expert rogue. I'm going to look for traps real quick. I'm going to spot the ones that are there and then I'm going to open this thing up. So, all right, I'm going to use my skills to do X, Y, and Z. And the GM will tell you what to do for your roles. Don't, you know, pussyfoot around things. You can, you can say, you know, I'm hyper competent. Um, when it's necessary for me to be cautious, I'm going to be cautious. Um, but go ahead and play with confidence. Um, the other thing is, play with GMs that aren't going to beat you up every time you turn around. Um, we've all heard horror stories about GMs who don't treat your character like they're hyper competent. You know, oh, you didn't say you were checking for traps on the door. Well, of course I'm going to check for traps on the door. I'm an 18th level thief. Make, right, let me exactly. make the roll. You right, know, like when, that kind of thing. Yes. Those, and to be honest, if you get that character, if, if you get that that GM, just go find a just go find a better GM at that point. Um, but seriously, like, act like you're hyper skilled. Be um, competent. Be aggressive. I mean, if your character has some sort of weird treat, trait where they're uh, I shouldn't say weird. If their character's a trait that doesn't make them uh, extroverted, still, and the thing they're good at, they're going to be good at it. Um, or they're going to act like they're going to. You don't have to be super arrogant. You don't have to be Sheldon for the Big Bang Theory. Um, you can be, you know, Leonard from the Big Bang Theory, who's also super competent, but often is a little bit meeker about it. But when when they're in their wheelhouse, they know what they're talking about and do that kind of thing. Um, come prepared to use lingo. Um, a great example would be the sword fight in The Princess Bride. Hmm. Where the two of them are going back and forth. And they're, oh, you know, you're using the Vecchione defense. Well, I thought it was best on uneven ground. I'm going to counter you with the Everson maneuver, that kind of thing. You know, talk about that sort of thing. Do that sort of do that do that sort of thing. You know, play with it, narrate it. Um, I mean, the ultimate line that sort of from thing. that the ultimate line from that scene is the competency gig, right? Like, mm -hmm. I have a secret I've not told you. <laughs> I have not left handed either. <laughs> so good, right? Like, yeah. And again, as an, ambidext as an ambidextrous fencer, I got to use that once when I was taking fencing class. It was wonderful. <laughs> and again, the best thing is like when he's bested in that, yeah. like he doesn't kill him, right? Because his line is like, I would sooner break a stained glass window. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, again, it's the like respect, the um, reputation, um, the recognition, I think is the other mm -hmm. word we missed there, right? The, um, he recognizes him as a master, right? Yeah. And is like, it would be a waste to kill you. And we've seen um, that in a lot of modern, this goes back to GM stuff again, but we've seen this in a lot of, in a lot of uh, modern media, you know, where the hero and the villain finally meet and the villain makes some comment like, oh, you know, I was hoping to finally be able to match my intellect against yours. Or you yes. know, I, was hoping to, I was hoping to finally meet a gunslinger as quick as myself and that sort of thing. Um, all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, I'm going to go back. Recently, the James Gunn Suicide Squad movie, the, 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 uh, the blood sport and peacekeeper rivalry that goes on in the entire thing, where they're both hyper competent at pretty much the same skills. And the rivalry and the things about can you shoot a bullet out of the sky stuff becomes an ongoing thing where they're constantly playing at showing their hyper competence. Um, and there's definitely a scene in that movie that involves a book fight. And that's all good. If you haven't seen the new Suicide Squad movie, it's worth it. I have um, Oh, it's great. <clears throat> um, we'll have to watch it someday. But uh, yeah, play with confidence and, and keep going that way. Bob? Cool. All right. Question three. What techniques do you use when you are portraying hyper-competent NPCs in a game? Yeah, so for, for me, this is going to be uh, backup plans and contingencies, right? I think that, um, and I don't know, maybe this is just because, you know, by nature, I'm a project manager. And so I spend all my time hmm. thinking about backup plans and contingencies and that, like, you know, in my mind, that's what I respect <laughs> as hyper competent is like somebody who's got, you know, not only the plan A, but the plan B and C or whatever. So like my hyper competence PC NPCs will like always eliminate obvious things that could work against them, right? Like you're never going to be able to pick up a phone and call 911. Um, and even if you do, I like the spike strip with, you know, is going to take out the, you know, the police tire, the cops tires before they get there kind of thing. Um, they're always going to have an escape plan. Like 
always have an escape plan. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be fair to the players, because I don't want that to just be like, whatever the players say, um, I'm going to like basically negate it because that's kind of dickish. So I put all that stuff in my prep. So like in my prep, I'll be like, they have an escape plan like to, um, you know, like they have a boat waiting for them in the canal Um, or, you know, they've put a, you know, um, cell phone disruptor, you know, on the building, whatever. And I write all that stuff into my prep. If the players come up with something that's not in my, it not like that I didn't list and it's not glaringly obvious, like I just missed something like, oh, they, of course he should have turned off the cameras and I just forgot to write it down. If they come up with something like, oh, you know what? I bet if he tries to get away, he's going to take the canal. I say we like, you know, sweep through the canal and see if there's any like suspicious boats. I'm going to let that play. Like, I'm like, cool. You just outthought the, like, you just outthought the villain. Like, I, and, and I'll reward you. And if that means that the scene for me winds up not being as tense or dramatic because you actually legitimately outthought the prep that I wrote. Okay. I'm okay yeah. with that. Like you guys are experts. Like you did it. You outthought the, the bad guy. I so I tend to um I will write some of that stuff down in my prep and stick to it but I also honor the fact that if the players um exceed my prep they should be rewarded for that like yes you actually did take down somebody really um hyper competent but you legitimately thought ahead of them and I don't do something like oh if they're going to sweep the canal he also has a hang glide like you know in the middle of the <laughs> yeah. game like it's kind of cheesy and that's just nerfing players right like that's just yeah um which we never suggest that's not fun (laughs) like it's not fun to frustrate the players by making the hyper competent character just you know like no matter what they do it's it 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 doesn't like you can't beat them that's not fun hyper competent is not uh, invincible yeah how about you jer um Pretty much what you said. Plan a little bit about what they can and do prepare for. My big thing is, like you said, resist the urge to just undo what the players want to do. Have technology and solutions beyond what the characters can do and expect, but um, be prepared. Think about how you as a player would would go into that situation. Have a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan. Um, you know, plan ahead within your their wheelhouse, you know. Um, if this character is somebody who is um, a master tactician, they might not prepare for specific um, technological or magical effects that they're not aware of. Yep. Um, and especially if your players take the time to plan ahead for those sorts of things. If they take the time to um, think themselves, well, you know, this is Baron Von Badass and he's, you know, um, the greatest swordsman ever. So we shouldn't probably even try to go up against him with swords. We need to have, you know, Bob the fighter take him on for a little while. But meanwhile, we're going to come with something that isn't in that same vein that we have available to us. Um, and, and do that sort of thing. You know, always reward the players for thinking outside the box. Um, I, I, I love I love when players yeah. out I love when players out think me oh. um, like in a in a um, in a scene. Like I'm I'm always like, uh, yeah, you guys totally caught him off guard. Yeah. Like, well, let's like, run with that and be cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, that's cool. You guys totally did it. We'll find something else to like to continue playing on. Like we're good. In fact, I'm I get kind of excited about it. Like when the players are like, "Oh, we're gonna like sweep the canal and find his like getaway ship." I'm like, "Oh man, then I want him to get away, only to discover like the boat's been like tampered with and won't start." Right, mm-hmm. and then the players show up and are like, you know, looking for this and like toss the spark plug on the you know on the yeah. floor of the oh, boat yeah. or something yeah. like that's that's badassery that i am a hundred percent um i'm a hundred percent there for if my players pull it off mm-hmm. um it's, yeah it's amazing I mean, it's amazing when you get surprised by the plans your players and and don't ever feel feel intimidated or put down by that remember that chances are your players are as smart as you are yes. or very close or or very close to it um, <laughs> but uh but there's also you know anywhere from two to nine of them thinking against you as well. Yes. And uh, that that's, you know, your plans are never going to completely go through. Um, it's one of the things I learned when I was playing a lot more 
tactical tabletop games like Warhammer Fantasy or D and D and that kind of thing is that you know I can plan what's going on, but I'm going to have you know six other pairs of eyes looking at the same table and seeing things that I'm not and enjoy what they see and they point out and ask you know and work with. Yeah, um, if if you don't want it messed with, you got to go with the Watchman rule, right? Like if you don't want it messed with, like you have to do it where like you know. I wasn't going to stand around and tell you my plan. If there was any chance you could stop me, I did mm-hmm. it 35 minutes ago. Yep. Like yep. you gotta, you just have to do that. Like that's, you know, so that, that, that is, that is exactly it. Cause otherwise you end up with, uh, you, you end up with the problem of constantly trying to, Oh, what happened this time? What did I do this time? And that, uh, yeah. I don't, if I stick it out there, and leave it up to a role, then I am fine with either outcome. Yep. If I don't want it to have a role, then I'm going to narrate it into the game. Mm-hmm. Like if I want the super smart guy to ambush you guys, um, I'm not going to like, I'm going to let you make the sense danger so that you're not completely caught off guard, but that ambush is coming. Like <clears throat> I'm just going to hard cut into that scene be like, make a sense danger. Okay. Uh, just before the guy, like as the guy pulls out his gun, you become aware that you're in the middle of an ambush. What do you guys do? Like, but like not, you know, I'm not going to like let you thwart it, you know, five minutes before it happens um, unless I want that to happen, right? Like, oh, you guys are sitting out at a cafe eating, um, you know, make a sense danger. Oh, you notice that a like, you notice that throughout the cafe, various people aren't really eating and they're all just starting to kind of look in your direction. Right. Like (laughs) then I mean for you to possibly get up and move this to a different area. And again, that's a lot of, that's a lot of um, where to put the die roll. And if I absolutely want you to act before the bad guys, you know, then I might say something like as you're eating on the, you know, as you're eating at the cafe, uh, you spot the guy two tables away has a gun under his jacket and is looking in your direction you're pretty sure he's watching you right like i don't even make you roll for that i just put it out mm-hmm. there like oh let's get moving yep. and and a lot of that has to do with where you want like how you want competency to play into that seat yep yeah it makes a huge difference in, in how you allow the players to be their um to, to be their characters at their best Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Uh, basically, this this all comes down to being a fan of the characters while still giving them good challenges. Yeah, That's absolutely. Really comes right? down to. You still, yeah. I mean, there are times where you still want them to make roles. I just don't want them to make like I don't want them to make like the silly roles. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I I don't want them to make you know I don't want them to make the role to I don't know break down the door. That's not interesting. Unless breaking down the door is the difference between, you know, getting trampled by the Tarrasque or something. And then I absolutely want you to make that, that role. <laughs> well, yeah. But that's Again, it's the Roger the rabbit. Company. It's the Roger rabbit rule. Mm-hmm. Could you take your hand out of these handcuffs at any time? No, no. Only, only when it was when it was fun. fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so good. Awesome. Anyway, I think that's it. Right. I think, did we, yeah. I think we've, I think we've said what we needed to say. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so that was our look at hypercompetency. All right. We hope that next time you're GMing a bunch of geniuses in your game, this advice will be some help for you. Now we're going to slide into the chat room one more time before we head off to the conversation corner. So uh, Queen Senda uh, made a note in the chat room, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that with regard to uh, fake competence, there's a game that she said uh, we should highly take a look at called A Response to the Esteemed Dr. Crackpot. And she left an itch link in there. Oh. We'll take that itch link and we'll put it in the uh, in the show notes as well. But I, I um, believe at some point in the in the pandemic that was being played in one of our um in yep, our Slack so room. I was just about to mention it. There's an actual game and it's hilarious. Yeah, I'm personally not familiar with it, but uh, I'm sure if Senda has uh, endorsed it, it's gotta be good stuff. Mm-hmm. It's also funny, if I recall. It is. Oh, lingo faking fun. Even better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Spout some bullshit. All right. That's good. If I remember correctly, (laughs) it's a bunch of scientists 
posit somebody posits a theory or a technique or or some sort of experiment and then everybody else um posits their pros and cons and arguments for and against using ridiculous lingo um interesting so kind of a uh, twist on like the snake oil type of of game where you're if anybody's familiar with Girl Genius, it it's it very much feels like a bunch of sparks arguing about theoretical stuff. Oh, you man. know, Girl Genius so. is so good. It, it is. is good. It is. I can finish reading it, it one is. day. I'll let you borrow the books. I've got a, I've got all the. I think I have tomorrow. almost all of them in PDF now because they had a couple of sales ah. on. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a bundle. So. Too. It was a humble, humble bundle. So I got a yeah. huge chunk of them out of there. All right. Well, I think that's. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Pardon me. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm making nasty noises here as we get ready to head into the conversation corner. Yay! Something about those tones. It's just. It's they're delightful. They're very pleasing, aren't they? Yes. Uh, so one of the things that I did, um, I enjoyed it very much, but um, I. I sh- Threw, threw a picture up on the recipe Slack channel of my homemade fried rice. I um, saw that. Look, I up. cheated like a bastard. <laughs> so let me tell you how I made this fried rice. So I started out with um, Senda. Queen Senda will be super happy and proud because I finally bought extra virgin olive oil. I have EVOO in the house now. So I throw a little bit of that in the pan with uh, with uh, some garlic, some cilantro, and some ginger, and I sautéed up my uh, my frozen shrimp because I got a big bag of frozen shrimp. So I've been using those to make you know stuff. So I get the shrimp all ready to go, and I had prior to this taken a bag of steam fresh chicken flavored rice with some veggies in it. I had cooked that, and then I put it into the fridge to cool down just so that it wouldn't be like fresh hot out of it cuz cold works better in the uh cold rice works better in a in a in a stir fry kind of a way. Yes, I heard that somewhere. And uh so I took that then once the shrimp were ready and I threw that in the pan and I, you know, mixed that up, started getting that all hot and uh, and and stuff and, and get a little get a little crunch on some of those rice bits. Threw a little uh uh soy sauce in there and got that all just uh, you know, fried up threw it in a threw it in a bowl and and chowed down um so it's not like i like cut up a bunch of veggies and, and made some rice like i cheated i used a bag <laughs> of ingredients I mean, that were ready to go but you know it's still it's all the stuff put together in one place to make a thing so and that's what i do one of the things that's that I've, what I I've, do. that's what i do i i fake it till i make it when it comes to food, one of the things that I noticed was I got myself into a rut where I eat like the same thing over and over again, right? Like sure. for for lunches almost every day, I buy every weekend, I make sure that I've got a good stockpile of of uh tortillas and I have uh packages of lunch meat and I have cheese and I have like mayonnaise and stuff. And so every day at lunchtime, I'll take a tortilla out, I'll put on some sliced ham, some sliced roast beef, some sliced turkey, throw a little mayo on it, wrap it up in the tortilla and make a burrito, which is not a burrito because it's not, you know, it's not Mexican. Sure. It's just a wrap. It's a wrap. But, it's a wrap. Yes. And I call it a lunch meat wrap when I put it into my fitness pal. But, um, but essentially, I eat like tortillas with a lot of stuff, but that's neither here nor there. But like the same thing over and over again. I do that with other things. Right. So I'm like always trying to like, okay, I need to, to, to do something to make this different. I like to buy that steam fresh chicken flavored rice because it's quick. It, you know, I think it's like six minutes in the microwave. Bam, it's done. And you can throw whatever you want in it. Sometimes I'll take, you know, the chicken thighs that I cooked up in like shake and bake or whatever, and I'll cut those up and I'll put those in with it. Or sometimes I'll, uh, I'll use the steam fresh, um, uh what do you call them the the baby broccoli blend that's got um like water chestnuts and uh and some stuff like that and i'll throw that into my um into my um ramen when i make my homemade ramen sure right so i buy some stuff and i'll like how can i use this in a slightly different way 
So that's what I did. I took this stuff and I said, I'm going to make a stir fry, air quotes. <laughs> and I put it in a pan. <laughs> I, I fried it. I did some stirring. <laughs> so, you know, I don't have a wok, but eh, whatever. Uh, and it tasted good. Although I will say that one pod of garlic, one pod of cilantro, and one pod of ginger in that mix, because I buy those frozen, those little frozen pods because they're easy. Um, the ginger was prominent. When that was all said and done, the ginger was like the most prominent thing I did. It didn't like, like, oh my God, I'm eating a bowl of ginger and nothing else was there. Like I could still taste the other stuff, but the ginger was like super there. Um, so I may like, if I do that again, I may like put like an extra garlic thing in there, maybe a little more soy sauce to, you know, temper it a little bit, change the flavor profile a little bit, but it was it was good. I mean, it's you know, I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, I don't think you're completely cheating. Completely cheating would have no. been if you had bought fried rice and then just put the shrimp in it. Like that would have probably yeah. been like actual and it's cheating. Like, you know, like, like yeah. gee, why am I? Why am I? <laughs> like I didn't make. I mean, a look, stir fry. look, I make I make ramen all the time. I don't make a broth from scratch, right? Like I right. I buy the shin ramen packet and put the flavor thingy in, in yeah. either water or chicken stock, like. It, I mean, there, I think there are various levels of quote cheating. I think that's a legitimate, um, I think it's a legitimate fried rice. Yes. Can you do fried rice all the way from, you know, day old white rice? Like, absolutely. Yes. Like, I've done it. You know, yeah. I have a recipe for it if you ever want to do it. It's not actually much more complicated um, no, really. than what you did. Um, it yeah. involves soy sauce and a couple, like one or two other things. It's pretty much the same thing. Was it good? Yeah, that's the thing. It was yeah, good. It well, tasted good. There you go. It didn't take long to make. So, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Um, but yeah, I, I like I said, out. Hold on. I'm trying to expand on. Um, I, I buy certain staple things that I use all the time. I'm just trying to use them in different ways to 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 get things more creative, and to uh, uh, you know not have the same thing over and over again. I do, however, have to buy some more stuff. I want to buy some fish sauce and. Uh, and a couple of other things that uh, that would go good in in some of these dishes to complement the rest of the flavors that uh, that I'm using. But um, so that's the thing that uh, the, uh, that I did over the weekend that I really enjoyed. Um, other than that, since the last time we were here, Book of Boba Fett is is ridiculous. Um, the final <laughs> episode of season one, which I'm sure there's going to be another season. There's got to be. Um, but the final episode is tomorrow, so I'm so, so looking forward to that. Um, Prodigy uh, wrapped up its, quote, season one, uh, or like the the mid-season finale of season one. Because um, I think they, they, it end, they ended up with like 20 episodes and they broke it apart. But it's still, I think, all one season, according to what they're saying. And the other 10 episodes are going to air later this year. Um. I sat down and I watched Encanto and also Raya and the Last Dragon um, because uh, everybody was talking about Encanto and I hadn't seen Raya and it looked interesting. Um, super good movies from Disney. Really enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. um, did a Lego build, a little, just a little set just to, to have some fun. Um, I took a huge break from No Man's Sky. Uh, with uh, At the top of the show, I mentioned the, the muscle in my back and the shoulder area. It was really bugging me. And sitting at a computer for a long time, using my right arm for the mouse, um, does not make that feel any better. So most of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I did not use the computer a lot. Um, so I took a huge break from that. Um, and then, of course, we played NBA. And I got tired of trying to monkey around with the PDF, even though you can make a, a form fillable PDF. Um, the PDF that we were working with, that I was working with, wasn't form fillable to begin with. I played with it a little bit, but then like we hand in our character sheets to fill at the end of the game. And then this session we did remotely because of a, of a, of a COVID issue with one of the player's families. So Phil took pictures and made PDFs of the character sheets for us. And I'm like, you know what? To keep up, with keeping track of everything, I made myself a character sheet in Google Sheets because I like doing that. So that was another thing I did. To, it 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 felt good to do. I enjoyed doing it, and uh, you know, so it, it's a great game. But man, the character sheet that they give you for the characters is not great. Yeah, nothing not nothing is sheet. is where it makes sense. And uh, 
it, your version is so much easier to work with. So um, it was a lot of fun. So yep. I'm glad we got it. So, but that's uh, that's probably enough for me, Jerry. What do you got going on? Well, um, my one thing is I finished watching season one of Yellow Jackets on Showtime. Um, it's a very interesting story that did not go where I want, where I expected it to go, not where I wanted, where I expected it to go. Um, it's about it takes place in two timelines. It's about a group of uh, girls playing soccer in New Jersey who somehow end up lost in their plane crashes in Ontario, and um, not all of them survive the crash, and then they're stuck and nobody knows where they are. And they expect to be rescued in a week. And instead, it's months and months and months. And things happened while they were lost out there. And it's implied that they may have hunted down and eaten more than one of their members. And then the other half of it is it's now 30 years later, 25 years later. And the survivors are trying to get on with their lives. Some have remained in contact, some haven't. And um, something weird is going on now. And it started out feeling like a just a kind of you know what horrible things did we do while we were out in the forest and as the season goes on there is something definitely supernatural going on as well and hmm. uh season season one ended they didn't give you all the answers but got some stuff but it's um the uh young the the soccer player girls are all um there's a lot of hey i know that character from somewhere one of them is the the girl from Stranger Things, the redheaded girl from Stranger Things, is one of the was one of the actresses, um, and the adult versions um, of of three of the four main characters are Melanie Linsky, who you guys you might know as the neighbor Rose from Two and a Half Men, among many many other things, um, and then Christina Ricci and uh, Juliette Lewis. Hmm, okay, and they are just acting out. They are acting incredibly. The, the acting is amazing, but it's a mystery and. You don't know who knows what, and um, they've all got severe PTSD. Twenty-five years later, and how they're dealing with it is um, very is, is very so. Just a very good show. I enjoyed it. Um, like Bob, I finished watching Prodigy, and um, that show had a very slow start. But I'll tell you what: the last four episodes are worth it. Um, this show, the last two episodes have been has been really really good. Um, they got the characters where I wanted to see them go. Um, NBA was just so much fun. Um, we ended last session on a cliffhanger. So this one picked up where we were all in a bunch of really oh shit moments and things went sideways and everything. And we still had a really good time with it. Um, I also did a little bit of Lego. I'm, I'm doing some Lego design. So I've been slowly but surely gathering pieces and reorganizing and putting things together. And it's just been my kind of escape at least one night a week. Um, and uh, been playing a lot of No Man's Sky. Bob and Phil have taught me a lot of things that uh, have made the game a lot easier for me. So I'm enjoying it as kind of a, a late night relaxation. And uh, lastly, on recommendation from friend of the show, Glenn Seiler, I started watching Doom Patrol, which is uh, DC Comics. It's actually kind of the it's it's the comic that inspired the X Men, and uh, it is five uh, super sort of I don't want to call them superheroes five people with extraordinary powers that make them freaks and outcasts and how they deal with things and the acting is good and the stories are interesting. It's a slow burn, but the storytelling is really good. And it's a great example of how, um, how to, how to reveal information step-by-step step without giving away all the mysteries, but giving enough that the questions that are asked are mostly answers that the, the watcher feels satisfied that they're not just being, um, having something dangled in front of them like a lot of people do. So I'd recommend Doom Patrol. It's a darker series. Um, the characters say over and over again, we're not heroes, and they're not. They're not bad guys, but they're not always heroic. So, Phil? Sure. Um, my one thing for this week is um, I finished the uh, Netflix show Travelers, got to the end of season three. Um, hell of an ending, actually. I wasn't 100% sure where it was going. The last, the second to last episode was a, uh, a uh, bit of a gut punch and i was like oh man and then it, like halfway into um the season or the series finale because i think they knew it was a series finale um i think they knew they weren't getting picked up and so they just kind of like they had this closing episode and um halfway through i'm like what the fuck is going on with this thing like i, I really don't understand how this plays out and then it takes a turn and i was like oh 
and then I was like, okay. And then some cool shit happened where I was feeling really good about it. And then the last screen of it, I was like, oh shit. Like even better. Like it was a good solid ending for a series. I actually really liked this series. Um, I liked it a lot. I could make a game out of this series. Like mm-hmm, yeah. the premise, the premise and the, some of the mythology around it is actually pretty slick. Um, it would, it is a definitely playable um, TV show. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, McCormick, forget his name, his first name, Eric, maybe Eric McCormick. I forget. Oh, the, uh, Will um, and Grace. Yes. From Will yeah. and Grace. He is, um, he's fantastic in it, but even not even my favorite character. Um, uh, I think out of the whole series, if you've watched it, I think ultimately my favorite character is um, Trevor, um, who is uh, who's um, he's young but also old. Without giving too much away, um, but anyway, thoroughly enjoyed it. I really, I, I finished it. I've been watching it on my iPad while I've been eating meals, but I finished it tonight before the show on the on like my TV. I was like, oh, I got to watch the finale on the TV. Other stuff going on. Um, a lot of stuff you guys already talked about. I'm also um, knee deep in No Man's Sky, just just doing my thing, not even progressing very fast, just having fun exploring and doing stuff. Uh, NBA was a lot of fun. I think we've wrapped our first arc of NBA. Like I'm getting ready. Like we'll be writing our second arc of the um, of the series. Uh, Send and I converted our long live the Queen game into Cortex Prime from uh, Thirsty Sword Lesbians. I really like what we built. We're going to do um, the actual character creation. And then hopefully in a week or so, we'll actually get to play it um, just to kind of play through the mechanics. But uh, the building block stuff came out really nice. Like we found the right building blocks to make up characters. Um, and I really, it's the thing I really like about Cortex. Probably talk a little bit more about that in the after show. Uh, and um, just briefly, um, I made my own, I'm, for the first time, I made brownies from scratch um, this weekend. Um, based on a, um, with a little help from Senda and a little coaching, um, on FaceTime, but I made brownies and oh, they're so good. So good. I mean, in fact, when we're done with the show shortly, I'm going to go have a little vanilla ice cream and a brownie, uh, before I hit no man's sky. That's me for the week. Nice. Take us out, Bob. All right. Thank you to everyone who's listening tonight and it's time for the Patreon shout outs which we have wrapped around to the Royal Court again. So, thank you so much. Andrew Dacey, the Warden of Whiskeys. Andy Olson, the Duke of Dice. Bread, the Royal Mead Maker. Craig, the Lord of One Name. Chromatic Chameleon, the Queen's Spy Mistress. Eric Bontz, the Duke of Gators and the Lord of Beefness. GM Gerrymander, the Lord of the After Show. Jesse Edmund, the Royal Doctor. Jim, the Royal Merchant Emeritus. John Carney, the Court Necromancer. Kevin Lovecraft, who was with us earlier tonight, the Royal Beard. Richard Wyatt, Captain of the Royal Airship Fleet. Schmitty, the Keeper of the Labyrinth. Tiberius Starcrash Smith, one of the greatest names ever, the Baron of Britannia. Todd Crapper, the Prophet of Probability. And Richard Duane, the Knight of Roseville Beach. Thank you to all of the Royal Court, and thank you to everyone for listening tonight. Indeed, indeed. If you are free on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's time, thank you. You're welcome. Come join us live on Twitch, where you can chat with the other listeners in the awesome chat room for life and ask us the occasional question. If you cannot make your live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcasts. And take a listen to some of the other shows on the Mr. Clark Network, such as They're a Super Geek, Mastering Dungeons, Bone, Stone, and Obsidian, The FM Gamers, Panis Talking Games, The Gnome Cast, Jean Coup Hustle, The Lounge, Bonus Experience, and back episodes of She's a Super Geek. You can and should also check out our sibling podcasts, Tabletop Bellhop, The Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming and BS. Just before you show your player why they don't need to make that skill roll because their character is so brilliant, leave us some feedback. You can reach us directly at the old-fashioned email, mmp at misdirectedmark.com. Hit us up on Twitter. The show and the network is at misdirectedmark. He's Robert M. Everson. He's GM Gerrymander. I'm DNA Phil. 
If you like what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaigns. MMP, Mastering Dungeons, and Pandas Talking Games are at patreon.com slash MMP. Django Hustle is at patreon.com slash Django Hustle, and Bonus Experience is at patreon.com slash Bonus Experience. Patrons of MMP, Mastering Dungeons, and Pandas Talking Games get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the Bamboo Lounge, and other special releases. This has been a Mr. Mark production. The media arm of Encoded Designs. Mic drop. We out.